are you doing? Anyway, well, let's welcome our legends on. Let's say we'll give it a big round of applause then for the four guys that you want to hear from. Let's hear for Guy Branston. Okay, Brown is here. Let's have a round of applause as well for Mark Todd. And give a warm Rotherham welcome for the return of Ben Pringle. And a final round of applause for John Brecken. So, okay, I've got some questions here that have been sent to us already, but on your tables you will see a bit of paper and a pen. So what you need to do, guys, is get your thinking caps on between now and the second session. Write some questions down, and the best ones we'll read out in the second half of the Q&A. Okay, so we've got some questions to do here. Have a think, be creative, write your questions down. I'll come and get them a little bit later on for the second half. So... We're going to start off with a nice easy one. There are some very interesting questions. We've already got a question here. We've got some very interesting questions here, but we're going to warm the fellas up with a nice easy one. So let's go across the panel. What is your best and worst moment in a Miller's shirt? John, do you want to kick us off? Well, obviously, in a Miller's shirt was 80-81, that great side. Uh, played in every game, uh, won promotion, the championship, and got in the PFA side, so... Can't better that. Uh, I think the best moment for myself would would obviously be the. To be fair, the, the whole four years was was too good, but definitely the back to back promotions and obviously finishing at Wembley that was by far the best moment. Um, worst was Steve Evans is literally too many to mention. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I could I could possibly single one or two out, but yeah, too too many worse memories. Cheers, Prings. Um, the best moment was um, probably the second goal away at West Brom. I think it was the first time we'd uh, played a league match there. Um, that box to box goal that nobody ever sees anymore because it's just it was. 1844 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that was a magnificent moment for me. Um, two two on the day it was a great performance by the boys. The very worst moment uh, in a Rotherham shirt was when um, that little uh, Scottish prick walked through the door, Mr. Archie Gemmell, and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, best time for me was uh, Mason's on the Sunday. <laughs> and uh, probably Monday night was the worst after running with your brother. So, yeah, it's uh, no, honestly, it was, um, I think the first two years, obviously, back to backs, and then the second two years was, was quite tough. But again, like Prince says, four years, still turning up now at this sort of age, talking about <laughs> the Robin years, which is always baffling when you can't the way up. But, Thank you. I appreciate being here. So. Okay, good answers. Um, second, kind of warm-up question, really. Uh, who's the best and worst manager that you ever played for? Uh, John Brecky. Um, very hard one, that. I uh, played with, again, well, not many managers, but I think the best manager uh, in my career for eight years was Jim McGuigan, because I, I learned hell of a lot of him. But the best manager by far, the best manager by far was Ian Porterfield. That one year was unbelievable. The worst. The worst. On the worst, the worst manager uh, has got to be uh, Emily Hughes. I mean, what a tremendous footballer, um, but management wise and uh, me personally, never got on with him. I played for him, a lot of games for him. But uh, I just didn't get on with him at all. Uh, I think for me, first and foremost, was uh, Andy Scott. Um, everyone obviously knows we clearly didn't get along. Um, and the best and the worst is obviously the big man, Steve Evans. <laughs> for many reasons for both. 
Yeah, I've got that uh, love-hate relationship with uh, Mr. Harry Bassett. Um, I can't touch upon Archie because I'd just get angry. <laughs> and being a Belfast boy, I don't want to put them back on the UDA list. <laughs> then he came off about 30 years ago. Uh, however, my brother still wants to come across. Who are we hurting first, Mark? Who are we hurting first? <laughs> I mean, there's a wee fucking Planet 8 guy over there that's pretending to be a Scottish international. Or, sorry, he was a shit brand club. Um, but worst and uh, best and worst was Harry, Harry Bassett. You know, he, he gave me my league debut. He picked me for 100 games and then he stopped picking me for some reason. So, yeah, um, he's a, obviously a fabulous character. Um, we have a laugh about it now. But, uh, but yes, um, yeah, he's a, he's, a top, he's a top guy. Uh, actually, probably not. I had about 55 fucking managers, <laughs> and uh, there's not many good ones, so it's gonna be a long fucking night, isn't it? Um, obviously, Ronnie's here, so I've got to say top five for Ronnie, haven't I? I mean, that genuinely, he's a, he's a fucking great guy. I just give him a big old day. He struggled dogging me because he can't twist his neck, but he's a fucking great guy. How is it? He's behind me again, is it? <laughs> Listen, you know I've got a lot of uh, I'd say top three, mate, if I'm honest to you, uh, but Martin O'Neill was unbelievable. Um, amazing guy to work with. A young kid growing up, learning about football, learning about what it's about, management, and being around him on a daily basis is unbelievable. And then, obviously, Ronnie came and saved me life like a... Hooked you twice already, mate. So, fuck me. Um, yeah, I'll probably say off about 10 times if I'm on this in breath. But no, and the worst was a bloke called Tony Adams. Uh, I, had, I had 10 minutes with him at Wickham. Um, amazing. Like I said about, you know, true, true players coming into management straight away, thinking they know it all and they were miles off it. I was amazed by how bad he was. But that's my uh, worst. <laughs> it, was, it was really bad. I think. Uh... Just on that one, the guy, uh, me and Ronnie, as you know, we got the sack at Rotherham and we, five days later, we ended up at Oldham Athletic. We were introduced to the players, we walk into the players and as we walk in, guy straight away goes, I thought I got rid of you fucking two. <laughs> Just a reminder, I've had a quick message that the bar is now closed while we're doing the Q&A, but it will be back open as soon as we finish the Q&A. Right, let's have some of the questions that you have sent in. Uh, this is from Anonymous, and some of these are anonymous, I'm not sure why, but anyway. Uh, this is from John. Uh, this is for John. Uh, after spending many a moment in the changing rooms over the years, uh, which players had the biggest ego? <laughs> A little bit awkward, that but no, I think at Rotherham, I think it's a club and it, it is now. I know it is now. I don't think we've had the big egos and the big time Charlies, uh, certainly not. It's uh, a well run club from that point of view. I, I go back to uh, Emily News, were different, he were a different breed. He played for England, uh, how many times? He were an unbelievable player, Emily. Uh, he breezed in after Ian Porterfield, a big, big name, but uh, a big disappointment for me. Uh, we had the year which were a successful year. We were third bottom and uh, we went the eight games in Feb February, which was an unbelievable February. And, uh, you know, we went to third top, but it just fell away after that. He was hardly in the club. We hardly trained. Uh, you know, it suited some players, but not for me. Uh, so for me, and he had a big ego, believe me, what he'd done and, you know, who he'd played with. And he used to let us know that. So for me, Emlyn, but... Uh, as other players, no, I've not really come across many at Rotherham. Um, that's a oh, sorry. Sorry. That was just a, that was just a question for you, John. We've got a slightly different question for Ben. Okay, here we go. This is from Rich. Can you talk about the time that Evan shot himself? All the best in that one. I thought this would come out a little bit later, to be honest. It's, uh, it's quite early doors. But yeah, I can uh, I can talk about it. Um, so we were going to an away game. Um, I'm not sure where it was. Um, and obviously on the bus, it's quite dark. It was travelling overnight. So um, there's obviously the toilet on there, which is quite small. Um, and the manager, Steve's gone in there. Um, and he's gone in. 
touch on pick up they're back on, yeah. So he's uh, he's gone into the toilet. I've I've gone down to go to the toilet. He's still in there. Five, ten minutes, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five minutes have gone by. He's in there for a long time, basically. Um, obviously, on an away game, it's uh, it's quite dark down there. So obviously, I was the next person in after Steve Evans, um, and obviously the light didn't work when I went in there. Um, so I've gone down the stairs. The door's kind of shut behind me. Um, the light's not on, so it's pitch black. Just got my torch out from my phone, so I can see what I'm doing and stuff. Um, anyways, I've come out of the <laughs> come out of the <laughs> and uh, I've put the door back and looked up, and I seen Joe Scores and Richie Smallwood. Their faces were just staring in complete and utter disbelief. Um, the light, funnily enough, came on when I was leaving uh, the toilet, not as I was going in. So I've kind of looked against the toilet door and there's, there's just shit all down the toilet, <laughs> toilet door. Into the, the toilet, there's just shit there. Um, we had a tracksuit at the time which had like white stripes kind of going down the tracksuit bottom. <laughs> Yeah, the ship was on my tracksuit bottom. Um, so, <laughs> this is on a way to a game, by the way, where it's professional, like, it's just, and I've got Steve Evans' shit all up my tracksuit, so, um, obviously I've gone up the back of the bus, getting absolutely slaughtered from the lads, um, and I think I stripped off uh, down to my boxes and actually walked off the bus to the hotel, um, wearing only my boxes so uh because obviously i was thinking the place out but he, he knew what he was doing and it wasn't the first time that that happened uh that season so i don't think it got on anyone else apart from myself but that was the steve evans ship story <laughs> uh, we drew three three against preston i think it was so but it wasn't the first time like i said Wow, that's quite an interesting uh, motivational technique there from the manager. Um, Mark, an anonymous one here, it says, who was the biggest star in the changing room when you were at Man United? Uh, lots of big big players there. 1984 when I arrived as a naive wee virgin from Belfast. Um, <laughs> uh, looking back, it had to be... Brian Robson, he ran the bleeding club, let alone the, the dressing room. He was England captain, my night captain. He was an unbelievable professional. Um, and the, the drinking school is, is was real, um, but he was the only one that really <laughs> ran through it, uh, so to speak. Um, but he was phenomenal. As a, as a bunch of apprentices looking up to Robbo, particularly me as a centre mid or an, a, an aspiring centre mid, he was he was just phenomenal. He could do absolutely everything um, with and without the ball. He was intimidating. He was his people realise how good a, good a, good of a passer he was. I mean, um, particularly off just left foot, but he scored some wonderful goals. Um, but he was very very generous. If you remember at the time, he was he was the first player to be sponsored by New Balance. Um, and periodically, he'd be bringing in this. this boxes and boxes of t-shirts and just chucking them into the youth team dressing room and saying here you go boys on behalf of, of New Balance so you know behind the uh, behind the steel and the, the performances as, as they call them Captain Captain Marvel he was a, a, a brilliant role model for us certainly for me like I say aspiring midfield players so yeah Robbo ran the club <laughs> you know and it was, uh, it's brilliant looking back now and uh, having had those three years there and that great education I had that Kind of set me up for the, the next 10 years in footy. Okay, Guy, um, this one from Rich as well. He's got all the good yeah. questions tonight. Uh, what actually happened in the tunnel against Norwich? And did you get a good one in on Darren Huckabee? Yeah. <laughs> <Come on, guys. laughs> He's only come for this one. He's only got here for this one. No, it was a. Uh... I think I've told the story a few times, but it was Ronnie's fault. Um, I backed him up as normal, put my arm on my sleeve for Ronnie, like I always did. 
and uh, ended up fucked as normal. So uh, now we ended up off the pitch arguing, and Ockerby obviously was running the show. Unbelievable player, by the way, <laughs> phenomenal. Shouldn't be playing in the championship. I think we all agree on that. Um, again, it was you know we were up against it. We always were. We dug deep. We had a right good go, and, and we gave it his best shot. And it was leading into half time and heated clashes with um, Fleming and um, obviously Leon McKenzie and Ockerby and Ronnie's pissed that he's died. But he did, and you know I'm fuming with Leon because I thought he pit. Um, I thought you spat on me. I got your fucking story in my head. Um, so I sat there and, you know, started having a go at Leon and Leon starts having a go at me and he's cocked me shit accent and I've just lost my head and give him a slap at literally as we walk in. And unbeknown to me, there's a, there's a, there's a referee um, adjudicator now, isn't it? But a referee adjudicator sitting there at the top of the tunnel. It's some walk back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, from top to bottom in the old, um, the old stand and, I thought I caught him just outside, so no one's seen it other than a bit of the crowd on the on the cot. And I walked off because he's fucking picking his teeth up. And <laughs> I've gone down there, and like laughing, and I thought, yeah, fuck him. And he's gone mad at me. He's gone fucking mad at me. Like, what the fuck you fucking done? I, went, I ain't done anything. Fucking not my fault. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he said the referee seen me. And he's been, I think you got booked, didn't you, Gaffer? But he got booked and fucking. <laughs> You're, you're laughing as normal. Fucking, fucking brother. Fucking <laughs> And I'm, I'm sitting there going, I ain't done anything. I ain't done anything. <laughs> I forgot it. <laughs> like, we everywhere after half time, like just trying to get some oranges in there. And yeah, that was it. That was what happened. And obviously, we had an unbelievable game. You know, Teeth bought love. It was unbelievable that day. Scored. It was actually that day, wasn't it, Butts? Yeah, unbelievable. Scored with two teeth. And fucking his teeth were amazing, weren't they? I think he spent his sign on for on his teeth. They were the best fucking things I've ever seen. But great guy, again, legend, legend. Just while, just while guys on that. No, he's right. He's spot on that. But what I have to laugh at is, I think Rotherham people will know him, and I knew him from a young lad, Steve Pickervance. And in them days, he weren't. It was the fourth official, but it were a local referee they had. And Steve, he's a massive Rotherham fan, and I know the family. So anyway. We're up the tunnel, Ron is in full flow in the dressing rooms, and there's a little tap on the on the door like that. So I've gone to the rooms now. So the linesman. Not Steve Pickervans, the linesman. So he went, can I see him? And he says, uh, Guy Branson, yeah, sent off. I went, what? He says, he's sent off. I said, what for? He says, he's punched the player in the tunnel. Uh, the fourth official seen it. So it was Steve Pickervans. So I've gone in, he's in full flow now, Ronnie, having a go and everything. So I've just, I'm waiting to, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to get in like, we've got to organise here like, we've got a player sent off, so, uh, uh, tap Ronnie on shoulder, what, 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 I says, guy's been sent off, what the fucking hell have you done? And guy, straight away, done no, done nothing, and that's the story, unbelievable. Okay, this is um, this is to John from Mark. It says, "Okay, uh, is it true that <clears throat> Tony Stewart is so tight he only cries out of one eye?" Uh, <laughs> joking aside, <laughs> don't answer that, John. Um, joking aside, in your opinion, how much has Tony changed the landscape and the future of the club? Um, I think he's he's done a wonderful job. I mean, the state it was in when he took over. A uh, brave man to do it at the time. Uh, I know he's getting stick at the moment a little bit, but um, he's took it from Don Valley. We had to get out of Millmore at that time. I were down there with Mark Robbins. We had to get out. It was in a state. The lads weren't getting paid. Uh, it, honestly, it, the atmosphere was shocking. And to be fair, he's he come into the club, <clears throat> and I'll give him massive credit. He took it on. Uh, I mean, he's got a, a thriving business. Why get involved with football? And he did do, and he said that he'd have a stadium, and nobody really believed him, even I, probably one of them. Um, but he's done it, and he's produced, and he's moved him on from that. And the success he's had is unbelievable. When you think for a Rotherham, for the club, the size, size of the town, to do what he's done over the 10 years, I think it's the anniversary, is it today, somebody said? 10 years today. 
to do that and it, what it's done for the town, the stadium, when you go past it, when you drive in there. I mean, I love Milmore. I still do a fantastic little old stadium, but how we've moved on from that. And, you know, when you pass it in train or on that road, the New York Stadium, and I know because I was brought up in that area why it's called New York. And uh, so he's done a fantastic job. And I know fans, and there's a lot in here frustrated, get some money spent this time. It isn't as easy as that. I'll probably come on to that later tonight. It isn't that easy when you get success. Me and Ronnie had it. You get success, success. You've got to try and better the players you've got. And Warren is having a torrid time at the moment. He's got no air, but he's pulling it out. And I can tell you, we signed a player today. You all know that. Experience. Uh, the player, Grand Tall. So get on your, yeah, Grand Tall. Experience. He's a championship player. <coughs> Let's just hope. Well, he's signed for us. And he's on, he's on low. He's on low. Uh, he's come from Middlesbrough. Uh, and uh, I'll be I'll be meeting him tomorrow and fixing him up in, uh, in Wickersley because we like the Wickersley, we like the W, don't we? Has W given us anything tonight for this? But from 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 Warney's point of view, um, it's very very frustrating because the trying we had a, we had forms signed, well not signed, the forms were all ready for the lad from uh, Southampton coming up yesterday, midfield player, or two days ago. And the agent, it's a game of agents. We'll come on to that in, in later. Game of agents, the agent gets phone call. He diverts, goes to Stoke City and signs. I think it's wrong decision. I hope he plays a lot of games at Stoke. But, you know, it could be the wrong decision. He'd have been playing at Rotherham for his education. But it is frustrating time. Tony, going back to the question, he's done a fantastic job. Yeah, we're all frustrated. We'd like to see a bit more investment. Uh, but you'd have to ask him that, and I will. I'll, I'll never criticise him for that. Hey, uh, JB's got another question here. This one is for Tony and Brex. Uh, the only ones old enough to answer. Ha ha ha! It says. Uh, so there we go. Uh, how much has the game changed in fifty years in terms in terms of skill, technology, and fitness? It hasn't changed a lot, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with, first of all, the science part, and me and Ronnie, Ronnie's going to, they have urine tests now. You imagine me and Ronnie after Adam and Eve having a urine test the next day. Taking the fucking piss, John. Taking the piss, aren't they? So, no, the game has changed all of a lot. I mean, I remember the, my, my debut 18-year-old, Phillips, who was in early, God bless him, Trev. And I always wondered why the trainer, it was trainer then, no physio, no doctor. Uh, the doctor were getting pissed up in the uh, boardroom. Uh, but what happened was the trainer used to have a, a bottle of whiskey and I used to think the trainer you know, every trainer at every club had a bottle of whiskey anyway I'm lining up I've only played in the intermediates and in the reserves so it's my debut at Millmore home debut and I'm lining up we're ready to go out and there's the, one or two old pros in there Raymond Zanuck and Billy Wilkins and people like that all at once the bottle of whiskey comes out everybody has to have a swig Jim McInerney all the Scotsmen You've got to have a mouthful, I don't like whiskey. I don't particularly like it now. So anyway, the bottle of whiskey, you walk to the door and the trainer's there. Bottle of whiskey. You have to have a swig. You have to have a swig of whiskey. I'm thinking, oh my God. So Philip say, Barnsley lad, he has to have a swig. He has two swigs. So he's going out and I'm thinking, I've got to have a swig here. I've got to show that I'm a man. 18 year old, I have a mouthful of whiskey. I keep it in my mouth, and honestly, I couldn't wait to get in the tunnel. I spat it out. The first half, I just tasted whiskey all the bloody game. So the game, how it's changed, hell of a lot. You know, the pitch is a lot better. The science is unbelievable. The, the, they, take, they do that much science on, on well-being and players are looked after. The diets, they live right. Uh, they do look after themselves. That's probably because of the money that's in the game. Um, and I, I just think it has moved on all of that. And I could talk all night about how it has moved on. And, uh, you know, I, but I think mainly the, uh, you know, now players go down injured. They go down, they have a, they have a bottle, uh, they have bottles of water on the side of the pitch. They have a break now for water. Ronnie will tell you, you weren't allowed it. If you went in the dressing rooms at half time, the trainer would walk in, hey, you can't have a drink of water, son, it's your stomach cramps. You wouldn't el be allowed to have water but you'd have a mouthful of whiskey before the game. <laughs> so 
<laughs> and we've all, but we've all heard the story just before I pass it on to Tony. Jim McGuigan come out with it. He says, I, we've all, we've all heard of the old days. Centre forward, we're shorter at centre forward. We go to the pit top, we're shorter at centre forward. And then Ed had come up, I'll play. Anyway, finish his shift and he'd be on his way at Millmoor and he'd call in Moulders and he'd call in Millmoor <laughs> and he'd have three pints. And he'd go out and he'd score that trick. And Jimmy McGuin went, but what the fucking didn't tell you? Centre half, who he was playing against, he called it four fucking pubs and had four pints of lager. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, these stories go on and on, and we could talk for ages about how the game's changed, and it has changed all of a lot. I mean, these will tell you as well, they are looked after so well, the lads today. And rightly so, rightly so. The trainer had come on on a red hot day like now. You'd wait for somebody to get injured. The trainer had come on with his little bladder and the sponge. The sponge were in the bag. You'd wait for him to do the play and then you'd sneak up and get the sponge and you'd all share it. You'd all have a bite of the sponge. And it weren't well now, I think, by He had a new sponge at the first game of the season. It lasted all year. But he'd just been on the pitch and wiped all back of his neck, his face, all the snot, all the blood off. And then we'd pick it up and have a bite of it. That's the only water we had, honestly. Ronnie will tell you that's the only water you were allowed. Rightly so, the game has moved on unbelievable. So, but I could talk all night about that. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, I think as much as the, the cash has come into uh, into the game, obviously with the Premier League setting up in '92, um, I currently work for Man City, so you know, probably the world, and output is phenomenal. So, um, probably about five years, some finals. Well, I think the social media side of things, and probably boys and younger lads will probably get to know this um, or, or know about this more than, than perhaps our era, um, where you're so exposed um, and you have to behave right, of course, because that investment, either in your salary or your transfer fee, um, is. Is, is, is there, it's right, it's, it's top of your profile pick, whatever, you know, when you're talking about, you're talking about your salary, potentially, but definitely talking about your um, transfer fee. And and it's astronomical amounts of money. I mean, I remember starting at Man United, first year apprentice, 27.50 a week. <laughs> but, you know, these days, you're 16, you're 17, you're 18, you're all signing long-term contracts at the big clubs for thousands a week, you know, and it's, um, and, those guys probably at that point deserve it. Whether they keep deserving it, it's up to them. You know, that's just the market. Um, you know, there's there's been some, you know, charlatans have come and cream some money that they didn't deserve. But I always think that if, if you're in those terms and, and those figures, then I think you're good enough to be um, certainly starting um, on the big salaries and producing and, and, and performing at that level. Because if you don't, you know, some is unbelievable. Not that myself. Say, season, season, and um, So, watching uh, um, But um, going back to, uh, I think I had a little spell at a little spell at Wolves on loan, and last season I saw Wolves' first team picture for the season, and there was as many staff as there was players so 25 squad 28 squad 28 wraparound staff and i think that's where the science you know the strength conditioning the analysts i mean they analyze for fun i was talking to a i'm not naming i was talking to a very good goalkeeper the other day i looked and he said i'm so bad You say, a few people there, aren't you, Megan? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, before we get into this, the, your questions that you've written down tonight, John wanted me to mention Howard Webb was originally going to be here, but he couldn't make it. He's over in the United States. He's got a lot of work going on, but he's chucked in £500 for tonight for the charity. Oh, yeah. Let's have a round of applause for Howard as well. 
Uh, let's see what you've got for us then. This question, the first one is for Guy. Uh, hi, Guy. I hear you've got a, a trick with a 50p coin. Oh, what no. is that trick from Sean? Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to like a bet um, back in the day. We were just talking about it earlier, actually. Don't we all? And yeah, we all did, to be fair. So I, think, I think I got sucked into that Yorkshire thing of like having a drink on a Sunday and fucking gambling my life away. But um, no, it, and it was literally a bit of banter with the lads because I've got big nostrils. The lads used to sit there and go, God, fucking massive nostrils. You know, stick that up there, stick this up there. And before you know it, I'd have about fucking 12 quid, 14 quid up there. And uh, the lads never wanted it back, so I thought, oh, I'm fucking in here. So I do it probably four times, around, four times a time in the bar, and all of a sudden I've got about 50 quid in coins. And it used to happen on the, uh, abroad as well, so it was either a 50 pence piece or a euro. Fucking hell, the record was like 18 euros this side, 18 euros that side. And of course, the lads come and get it out. I went like that on the table, and never wanted it back. So there's 40 quid, boom. Do it again, do it again. Before you know it, I'm fucking coming home with money. So I thought, I'm fucking in it, I'm clever bastard. And that, that was it. That was the story, really. But yeah, it was constant. It was like every time I went out, it's fucking this one. My nose is massive now. And wait till it grows even more and get older. But ridiculous story, but very, very true. Clever bastard. Yeah. Yeah. I think just on that as well, guy. <laughs> we, we used to have trips. Me and Ronnie, we'd go paintballing. We'd have a uh, go kart racing. We loved the day at the races. And this day, we'd organised. The day at races, Southern racing, we've got a box there and everything. Great fun, lads. All at once, there's a knock on door. And why I mention it, because people do have problems with it, but Guy comes in, seeming, what are you doing, Gaffer? The day at races. I've got a problem. What's that? Well, gambling. He said, well, don't have a bet. No need to have a bet. And they were all on, weren't they? They were all on that day. But... We all went to the races, we had a great day out and we looked after the big man, but you're right for saying that because there is problems gambling. Well done, big man. So we've got a question here for Ben. Get ready, Ben. Uh, it says, how have you survived the last 48 hours in this heat? From Tony. <laughs> Back to 70, I think, indoors and in the shade. Um, yeah, someone just said to me there, to be fair, I swear I used to be blonde, so I look a lot different now than what I did back then, put it that way. Uh, but yeah, fuck me, some of the hair that I used to use in my uh, in my Rotherham days, it just, I didn't look well, put it that way. <laughs> some of us are just like the chance to use that hair now. Um, this one's for Breck from Robbie. It says, Breck, can you give us an honest opinion on the Dexter Blackstock signing? Whoa. Well, I'll be honest, um, I, I weren't involved. But, uh, um, just to tell you a story, when Wally asked me to just help him out, because obviously he didn't know whether he wanted the job. So I've gone in the first day and I'll be honest, it was an holiday camp, the place. The players leaving it quarter 12 and I'm thinking what am I doing here but the first game the first game uh, that I'm stood in the dugout and I'm looking at Warney out there and I've looked at a few managers out there and I'm thinking the loneliness of a manager and he didn't know really whether he wanted the job but uh, I'm there and he, he just looked at me and he, he was lost out there a little bit we were losing and uh, he just beckoned me and he went. I went to talk to him and he just says uh, what do you think about uh, change. So I've looked at the bench and obviously it's eye contact and Dexter it was freezing cold. Dexter were wrapped up in all the stuff and he stood that he looked the other way. He looked down down the line away. And then I did look at one or two others and they also give me away eye contact. And I'll be honest and Warney will tell you I went out and tapped him I said Warney just get on with it and let's see it out because they aren't going to help you. And Dexter in his career, if you look at his career and one or two clubs he'd been at, he did a job and he were a striker and it isn't his fault. It isn't Dexter's fault. It's the people that signed him, the people that get him the stupid contract, ridiculous contract it were, and it killed the club a little bit and it killed it for a lot of players because he walked away with a big payday 
but it's not his fault. It's not his fault at all. You know, anybody in here would have took that contract, but he, he, it was a crock. It was a crock. Dexter Blackstock, five operations before, was a good player. But five operations later, stupid signing, stupid signing. Thank you for a question from Dave on table two to Mark Todd. Uh, during your time as a first team player at Rotherham, who was the most talented player in the squad? Oh, now then, that's a good one. Um, we didn't quite see it at the time, but I suppose Goats must have been up there um, with the career he had. Um, but I think for me, the guy that pressed me the most as I walked through the door um, was a little laggy. Um, yeah, I mean, he was just a wee bit different, wasn't he? You just couldn't nail him down. He kind of just did his own thing, didn't he, Breck? Um, and he kind of complimented you know, my my game to, to a large degree. And I think that's why we got promoted and then we did so well that. 92, 93 season when we were bombing um, before injury hit me and one or two other problems set in. But yeah, I, I definitely say Rangi. Um, but I hope he's well because I know he's um, I know he's a tortured resource sometimes. I hope he's well. Yeah. Okay, this is from Robert. It is for Ronnie and it's very formal. It's just, and for Mr. Branston as well. Uh, how difficult is it? Okay, here we go. Oh, no, it's worse than that. Uh, how, difficult, how difficult is it to turn down, this is what it says in the question, the lure and the wages of Sheffield Wednesday, given the way that the two have just left, it says. And I think he's asking you to, because obviously, Gary, you went to Sheffield Wednesday and Ronnie you did not. He can wait to get rid of it. Come on, Ronnie. <laughs> well, it's quite easy for me. Is that why you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I know football, but it's all about money, Nick. Can, yeah. How much can we earn? Can we get this? Can we get that? As players, you understand that. But because my loyalty was obviously at Rotherham, I just, I'd have had to move to God. It would have been a nightmare for me to go to, to Sheffield Wednesday, right? <laughs> But the two lads who have gone, they've gone for the money, obviously. You know, for the families and whatever. And I, I, it's one of them, do we knock them or do we say, look, you did well for us, off you go and whatever. It, it's hard as a supporter when you see two players leave and you want to stay here. But at the end of the day, we can't match what they can get. We, we can't, we don't, there's no justification in us saying, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that. I think anybody in here, We've probably done the same thing. It's, it's all about money. So I, d I don't call him Judas or anything like that. Sorry? Because I love the club estate. So it's loyalty. At the end of the day, it comes down to loyalty. But sooner or later, that loyalty catches up with you and you're gone. And then you think, was it worth staying and doing this, that and the other? But at the time, you can only go with your principles. It's how you feel. If you feel that you leave and it's not right, but why do it even for more money? My missus went mad. <laughs> In what way? You're a legend, you're uh, yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, of course it is. I mean... It, it's difficult. Are you imagine moving from here and going to Sheffield Wednesday. My God, I'd have got undrawn and quartered. <laughs> so th there's no way in this world that I, I, I would have gone there. In fact, I actually had a chat with him just to see what they're messing about. So we've actually chatted about it. And then you look how much they got it off you, this, that, and the other. And still it's like, how can you turn that down? But something in your head says you, it's not for you, you know? So that, that's the main reason I stay because if I left here, I wouldn't be the king anymore. I might be the queen. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you passing it me now? Oh, that's right. Fuck yeah. <laughs> now the queen. Now well, now listen, it was, a, it was a totally different environment for me. Um, obviously, and, and talking about the guys, like uh, we're in a situation now where you know, <laughs> builders are turning down work because they've got too much on. You know, they've got double money that side of the road or double money that side of the road because, you know, we all need builders. So it's exactly the same thing. You know, 
literally over the road now. Our lads have been offered double the money to go and work across the road, and it's literally that that simple for me. So doubled my money and went across the road, and <laughs> that was it. I, I didn't think too much of it. Um, I was on probably on the way out anyway. We were at the time higher. Rotherham was higher than Sheffield Wednesday. I, I just killed someone in a pre-season friendly, so the the fans weren't really into me then either. <laughs> And uh, I signed on, uh, I think I signed in January, I think January, February, um, when I was on loan at Peterborough. So it was a pre-season contract, um, a pre-contract before the end of the season. And I knew about it well, well into the season. So it was the right thing for me. It is what it is. Um, I wasn't playing at Rotherham, so I had to move across the, the, the road and thoroughly fucking enjoyed it. <laughs> so, it, was what, it is what it is. And listen, you all know where my art is, and, and that's the most important thing. Same as Ronnie, like we love this place and we come back regular. So, it is. the next question is for all of you. Uh, what would you say uh, are the best parts of being a professional footballer? Uh, well, even today, I mean, the difference in the 50 odd years or so. It's just great to be involved in something that you love and earn a living from. Even back in my day, I mean, Toddy said around 27 quid a week at Man United. Uh, at Rotherham, <laughs> yeah, at Man United. But my first wage were five pound a week. I don't know what Ronnie's were at Tranmere, but, you know, just to, to play and for me, play for your hometown, even, you know, come through Rotherham boys and then juniors and the reserves and playing the first team and still to be involved to this day a little bit. Uh, doing little bits at the club it's just a fantastic sport to be in for me personally I played other sports but football it's the family I've got a footballing family and uh, I was just a five year old took to Millmore with my dad and that's it uh, so for me football is just a great way to earn a living even back in the days when we used to bite the sponge for a, a, a mouthful of water For me, really, it's just, it's living a dream. Everybody, uh, I'm not saying, well, it could be everybody now, because ladies are involved in everything now. It could be professional footballers. But you, the dream was you wanted to be a footballer. That, that was my dream, because I was thick as fuck when I was at school. <laughs> so I was lucky that, that my braids were in my feet. So some might say in your head rather than your feet, but, it, it, but it's, it's one of them things where you... you Going in every day, the laughs you have. I mean, we used to, when we were playing, we used to be in at nine o'clock and just you weren't training till half ten, but we come in for the crack just to have the laugh and that enjoyment that you had as a player. You just, you know, even as a manager, I was a player and then you could become a manager. It's a lonely place as a manager at times, but as a player, you just have it's just unbelievable when you're in that dress room with a good dress room because Rotherham United have always had good dressing rooms there's no way I know when I was here for the eight years our dressing room was was top notch we had no pricks in there no no big time Charlies if they were they were gone it's simple as that so the, the whole bunch were together and Wally talks about it now about the family club and this that and the other but that, that's a culture we had when we first come in in 97 so it's not changed from there it's just continued to, to the level that it's at now so for me, being a professional footballer is, is, was my dream. I was earning more as a butcher. I was 17. I was at Everton and uh, I got released when I was 16. Then I went to be a butcher. So I, I was learning my trade as an apprentice butcher. And then I had a chance to go to Tramir on trial. Went there, did the trial, got, what have I done? Went there, had the trial and got the, it, was offered a 12 month uh, contract at Tremor on on 20 pound less than I was in as a butcher. So, you know, the, the money at that, that stage was ridiculous, but that was my dream. That's what I wanted. And I was, I'm lucky and we're lucky up here that we've all had that opportunity to, to make it because there's thousands and thousands of, of people who don't make it. You know, and that, that's what disappoints me a little bit now about the academies when you've got six, seven, eight year old kids and they go to Sheffield United or Rotherham or Sheffield Wednesday, then they shoot them off after six weeks. Then they go to Sheffield Wednesday, Rotherham or wherever and they shoot them off again after six weeks. Our six, seven and eight can them kids, 
no wonder we've got uh, trouble with mental health and whatever. Yeah. These kids are just being put through hell at times. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. But someone will make the dream. And when you make the dream, it's just fantastic. There's, there's nothing better. Yeah, I think exactly what Ronnie says. It's first starts with you know just wanting to be a footballer. That's that's the first thing you think of when you're young. It's a, it's a dream, and I've been lucky enough, you know, to play at some great stadiums, great against great players, against great teams, and and like I say, that's what you you think about growing up. Um, I think certainly coming towards the back end of my career now, um, and and seeing the younger lads and stuff, you know, that they haven't had the opportunities that I've had, but. I think it's just, for me, it was always coming in every day, just playing football and not having to worry kind of about any other job or any other thing. You just focused on your football, you come in in the morning and like the lads say, it's for me, it was always a banter thing. So, and that's like, I miss it now and I'm still playing as weird as it sounds. That's the thing that I'll, I'll miss the most definitely is the banter and getting in with the lads and yeah, I think that that those are the two main things for me, especially at Rotherham. That was obviously the, probably the best time in my career. Um, I split up with my ex misses at the time. I was going out in Viper rooms four times a week and, and getting back to back promotions with Rotherham. So, big Steve telling me to go out every other day. So, <laughs> couldn't go wrong in my eyes. Um, so, yeah, that's. <laughs> That's the science behind my success at Rotherham. <laughs> I suppose trying to give it a, a, a bit of a different spin, obviously everything that the guys have said is 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 obviously relevant. I think for me as a young kid in Belfast, um, growing up in what was a troubled time back home and sort of being able to focus and and make your family proud. Um, I think that's for me the, the sense of pride of you know young international, scored international, and then um, signing for Man United. Literally, I was playing. We don't have academies back home. It's not a full time setup. I literally went from playing for my dad's youth club team to signing for Man United. So the sense of pride and seeing your mom's wee face, and you know when they come over and you do the signing, she made a beautiful stir fry for everybody. So for me, that's exactly. How it, how it makes me feel. It still makes me feel now. I see my mum and dad's face, you know, just that sense of, that real sense of achievement for me. I've always described it as climbing the mountain and and, and putting the putting the flag in the top of that mountain because I played, I, I have played in every division, every, all, all eight divisions from one to into, uh, into Unibond. So I've played in all eight divisions. So I've experienced, you know, the highs and the lows that football can give you. And the guys will obviously know better than most the, the highs and the lows and trying to get the kids these days to balance that against the expectations around them Ronnie's just talking about academies the expectation when you do go in at six seven eight it's ridiculous you know the mum and dad have already spent the cash so we're trying to balance that and my current role with with city again is trying to find not so much the cream on top of the the sponge but actually the sprinkles on top of the, the top of the cream so we're we're looking at the very top and that comes with great, again, great expectations and having to manage that um, that pressure. And the big man will know about it in his, his role as an agent now and obviously working for Leicester City. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult. I know it's, you're, we all know we're privileged, but we did it because we're good at it. And I always say to my two, my boy and girl, it's all right having a passion, but for God's sake, make sure you're very you're good at your passion, you know. So, it's it's for me again, um, without repeating too much. Just seeing my wee mum's face, God rest her, um, and being able to turn up and, and and see you know the love in the room for Rotherham United, for ex players, for legends. For me, that's I'll drive home tonight with another big smile on my face, knowing that the football family, which is why I set up my wee project. The football family has an effect on all of us at whatever level, whether you're a fan, a pundit, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a player, whether you're a chairman and owner, it all comes with the love of the game. So that's it. And be able to be doing that still 40 years on is what makes football magic for me. Yeah, 
Now we've targeted Man City for years. Um, now it's sport and the things that you want to you want to feel about yourself. You can get lost in sport in it, and I think that's what I always enjoyed about football. There's a lot of shit going on when I was younger, and where you can get lost in it and just disappear into the the rabbit hole of football and the rewards you get from being good at fucking tackling and <laughs> scrapping and fucking getting on the pitch and editing and off heading the ball fucking not punching on it. Tactical awareness, you said. Um, <laughs> but no, but look, it is, yeah, it is what it is. And I, I'm, I'm amazed by football and, and how much it gives back to the, the community. But just going back to what, obviously, Tony just said there, my missus hates me going out at night, leaving her with the kids. And she always said, every time I come away with you guys and come away and be part of the rob room, even on a Saturday afternoon, she's I'm a different person for a week because the boost it gives you or the mental health it gives you and, and the, the freedom it gives you to remember back what, you know, what how you felt and how you was because things do go missing in the game when, when you're out of it and you people don't speak to you as much as you used to and people don't call you as much as you used to and, and it's even ultra difficult now I'm an agent because trying to get Paul Warren to pick up the phone over fucking play I'm trying to sell him. It's fucking unbelievable. <laughs> Rob Scott, you know, I've fucking looked at him in the shower for fucking four years. Right? He's put me off for life and he still don't pick up the phone but I'm only joking because they're good people but there's some relationships you've got through the game that you've got to really, you know, use now for me personally. But and it's them pick relationships I picked up and the football family stuff that these lads have mentioned. It's like it can be a really deep world, but it can also be a fucking unbelievable world and an unbelievably um, happy world at times. But there's a lot more lows, isn't there? But the fucking eyes are unbelievable. The promotions, the fucking, you know, the lifestyle, the everything, and it's well worth that journey. It's well worth that. Um, that pursuit into sport and even we're talking about six and seven year olds getting disappointed like let's go again see what happens you know keep fucking going keep getting knocks and the ones with all the bumps on the road usually come out of it don't they? you know the man cities and the leicesters have them stories of lads who've took bumps in the road and if you're not used to them bumps by 14 15 you're going to struggle in the game because it's it gets bumpier and that's the thing you know and that's why i've got all them fucking punches and bumps in my head running <laughs> uh, but now he's, he's a top guy, top guy. Okay, we've got just enough time for a couple of very quick questions. Uh, ben, uh, can you tell us about the playoff semi, uh, the playoff semi after party? So an after party after a playoff semi final. Um, yeah, it was just a standard night in Vibe Rooms, I think, for me, to be honest. Nothing that I'd <laughs> not done throughout the whole of the season. Uh, I think it ended up in Spearmint Rhinos for an hour or so. Um, and then I think it was me and Tom Hitchcock on top of his car just outside my house at about quarter to eight in the morning. Um, obviously, the final was about a week away. So, again, probably wasn't the greatest one of my ideas. But, yeah, that's that's the role that we were on at the time. So it was really enjoyable. And uh, the last question, I'm going to give this one to Ronnie Moore. Um, what does it take... To be a Miller's legend. Oh, there's a test, isn't it? Um, <laughs> how do you answer that? Just give it your all. You know, uh, I, I've said it before and often people probably fed up of hearing it, but I always had a, not a dream, but a thought that I would come back in the, you, you know, when I was here as a player, I thought I'll come back as a manager one day and, and manage this club. And when it happened, it was just, it was unbelievable, you know, because I'd spoke to Breck before it about coming back in and being my assistant in here. And he'd just been with Danny Begara, so there wasn't much difference between me and him, was there, to be fair. <laughs> so, uh, what do you say? What, what do you say? I don't know. What you say? Who the fuck are on your mother? Chinese. I told you that. Irish, mate. Yeah, so... You need a lot of luck, I think. A lot of commitment. I mean, we, we've... Well, Brett's been here for, for donkeys, hasn't he? So, but I was a scouser coming over here. And, you know, as a player, I mean, the crowd were fantastic. You know, you, you give the crowd what they want and you, you've got to be a little bit lucky. And I think as a player, that's that's what happened. That's what we did. Uh, what I gave to the club until that prick, uh, George Kerr, came in. 
uh, with with all his reserves, some bloody Grimsby, this, that, and the other. That that's my age. If you'd have asked me before, you know, I, I don't dislike a lot of people, but he was just an absolute knob. <laughs> well, 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 well. And that, that's just my, my my opinion about him. But to be a ledge, I suppose you've got to give your all, give your balls, give your bollocks, uh, and it helps when you've got decent players. You know, when you look when we first came in in '97, when we were trying to build a team. You know, when you look where we ended up in in 2000. You know, with, with the change round, I mean, we were unlucky probably second year when yeah. we missed out on the penalties. When uh, little Asty missed a penalty, we won't say that too often, but love to wind them up on it. But uh, and then we get people like Brano coming in, Macintosh and Swales and proper. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> it, it's brilliant because when when I I used to say to Breck, I tell you what, this is tight, but I'm going to leave Brano on today. Will you go and fucking tell him? <laughs> yeah, so that's you said your fucking mate to tell me. Yeah. You, you know that's not true. <laughs> you said your fucking mate to tell me on a Friday. You know I've saved you so often, hey, mate. I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. Go back, go back. Up. The fucking joker, the man, used to be the fucker prime man of the match the game before, then tell me on a Friday weren't playing him right. Look at the fucking program on it. Look <laughs> at the match last week, mate. Yeah, you, you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just that Mac was fucking better than you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, guy. No, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> but you were unfortunate at the time that no, we had that many really decent set Yeah, we went back Sorry, am I arguing about it? Yeah, it was good, mate. It was fucking top of And you're a legend, you're all right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can answer that as well. You've all you've got to win promotions, haven't you? And these fellas here have got a few promotions between them. So that's a big round of applause for our legends tonight. And also to John, they've all given up the time to raise a bubble or two this evening. And they've done a tremendous job. So give them all a massive round of applause. Just just before the lads go, um have a little bit of fun. Ben's brought some of his match worn boots. I hope your uh, I hope your foot size doesn't match your cup, Ben. <laughs> right, these are match worn boot boots. Now Ben will sign them. Whoever gets them and the lads will sign them. I'm sure, won't you? The lads, Hi. yeah, the all the lads will sign them. So, oh, by the way, somebody I've not thanked yet, and that's. Rex daughter, Jess, Jess, come forward, take a bow. And Jess. Jess has raised with the raffle and the signatures £980. So we'll have a little bit of fun. Will everybody just please stand up just for a second? Don't worry, we're not going to be long, girls. By the way, big round of applause for the bar staff. Look at them. See, look at them laughing over there, eh? I'd be laughing too if I was fucking fiddling. Right. Okay. We've got three sets of boots. We're going to give them away. Three sets. So, everybody, stay on your feet if you wouldn't pay £20 for a pair of Ben's match-worn sign boots. £20. Sit down. They are legitimate, mate. Um, a bit of a smell of sweat, so we might have covered some ground this particular time. Uh, sit down if you wouldn't spend £30. Yeah, sit, sit down if you wouldn't pay £40. If you don't want to pay £40 for a pair of these boots, sit down. Sit down if you, sit down if you won't pay £60. Six, sit down if you won't pay £70. All the lads are going to sign him. Sit down if you wouldn't pay eighty pounds. Sit down if you wouldn't pay ninety pounds. Sit down if you wouldn't pay a hundred pounds. Sit down if you wouldn't pay one hundred and ten pounds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've got the fucking dingles in tonight. What are we up to? One to sit down if you wouldn't pay one twenty. 
How many we got left in? We've got three, three, four. We've got four gentlemen. Hmm? Oh, you're in as well, right? Well, we're up to 130, is it? 130 pounds. Sit down if you want, pay 130. Sit down if you. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 140. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 150. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 160. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 170. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 180. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 190. Sit. <laughs> I don't fucking want. Sit down if you wouldn't pay 200. If you wouldn't. Are you going to let them have them? You're still in. Okay, gents, all you three gentlemen have got one pair for £200. Come up and the lads will sign them. Uh, ladies and gents, please stay for the band. The band's come along tonight. Thank you. I thanked everybody earlier. Most of all, most of all, thank you for coming out tonight to support Rotherham Hospice. Have a say, Jenny. Enjoy the band. Stay for the band. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Freddy's on, on one on one. The Freddy's going to shoot. Can play that shot? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs>